welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Got Here, Mozio and Focus Wire's weekly podcast about travel and transportation and the innovators in those two industries. Today, we're joined by Brent Handler, the founder and CEO of Inspirato, one of the world's leading private uh, luxury destination clubs. Brent is actually a pioneer of the entire industry, uh, the destination club industry, having founded exclusive resorts in 2002, uh, along with his brother, Brad Handler, before founding Inspirato in 2010. So, Brent, we like to start every podcast out the same way, which is to ask you uh, how you got here. Well, uh, happy to answer that. And thanks, guys, for having me on. Appreciate it. A good opportunity to uh, tell this story that hopefully everybody finds uh, interesting. So, um, I guess I'll start by saying I'm 51 years old, so I'm a little older than uh, you know a lot of the entrepreneurs and older than you, and so probably uh, have a little bit more backstory than most. But I... Um, started my career um, not really in doing anything terribly interesting. I sold copiers for Xerox back when they had a direct sales force. That was uh, back in 1991. And then sold a copier to a company that was in the computer training business. Believe it or not, people didn't know how to use computers uh, way back when you were probably in uh, elementary school. So I did that for a little bit. Sold that company. And uh, then sort of did a whole bunch of nothing during the original um, dot-com bust and uh, kind of found myself a little bit down on my luck. Uh, I always describe it as um, in between careers, but it was more aptly um, unemployed. And I heard about a business um, that had this idea where you could, um, instead of buying a vacation home, you could actually um, join a club and um, go to lots of homes instead of just one. And uh, that really intrigued me. The name of that company was Private Retreats. And the day I read that article was April 1st in the Denver Post, which is where I live and where the companies are um, headquartered. In um, 2000, and um, it was 2001, actually. No, 2002, sorry. And so um, that just struck my interest that maybe there were a lot more people like me. I had a couple of young kids at the time and hotel rooms. Remember, this is way before Airbnb, way before VRBO. So people didn't really think about today what we would call the vacation rental industry. That wasn't so much of a thing. Vacation rentals, um, you know, back then were completely different. It was only in Europe or maybe in the Caribbean and they were super expensive and it was a whole different situation, you know, in 2002. And I thought if you could combine the benefits of um, a house with the benefits of a resort experience, staying at a hotel, which my wife and I really like to do, you could kind of come up with something interesting. And this company called Private Retreats was in the Denver Post on April 1st, 2002. And that business has since gone through a couple of name changes and failed many years ago, maybe over, uh, boy, maybe uh, 13 years ago or so that business went bankrupt. But I had the idea and I shared it with my brother. And, um, you know, at that time, I, um, I just thought, you know, there has to be a better way. So we came up with this concept. And uh, that concept was uh, Exclusive Resorts, which was the first company that we started. And, and Exclusive Resorts was a uh, traditional destination club. It cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars to join. The club used that money. Um, 80% of that money got used for purchasing real estate. 20% was essentially a transfer fee, a fee that uh, the club used uh, to cover operations. And then there were annual dues, and annual dues covered a set number of days. And that business, by the way, is still in existence today, exclusive resorts. And uh, it took us, you know, all of 2002 into 2003 to come up with that concept. We launched, and um, it was a pretty good idea. People liked it. It was obviously just quite expensive, and there were a lot of 
kind of restrictions around that sort of travel. And then early in 2003, I might date myself, I might have a day or two uh, wrong here. Um, I, got a, um, I got a lead uh, off of the internet from somebody named Steve Case, um, who was founder of AOL, which was actually a really big deal in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2003, 2002. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I called him back. Um, he ended up becoming our partner. We grew Exclusive Resorts to be uh, quite a pretty big business, uh, kind of the original pioneer of this destination club industry. And then um, the Great Recession hit, and that was a whole different um, avenue. Remember, Exclusive Resorts owned all of the real estate. Um, and so when the Great Recession came in 2008, 2009, that um, you know, model obviously was not as um, powerful anymore. And then I kind of um, looked at uh, the opportunity that we had at the time and sort of where that was going and what my role was within the business, not being the majority control. And then I decided to leave at uh, the end of 2009 and start what today is a, you know, much larger, uh, much, um, you know, bigger platform, which is our current company called Inspirado. So sold out of exclusive resorts um, and started Inspirado. And what I learned in that period of starting exclusive resorts was that people really did love this notion of um, you know the the size and convenience of a private home with the services and amenities of a uh, luxury hotel just didn't want to have to put a huge upfront capital commitment into uh, the equation and then also um, you know really realized that there were a lot of availability challenges when every day is worth the same. It's no different than a timeshare structure. I consider that sort of a closed end system where everybody's kind of fighting for the exact same inventory and the most valuable things get booked uh, first. That's not a great high net worth, um, uh, you know, kind of shopping experience. And both of these companies cater towards the, you know, top two or 3% of the population, um, primarily US population. Um, and so this was really meant to be a replacement for two rooms at a luxury five-star hotel. So that gets us to 2010. Um, so I had a, a one-year period that it took to, um, uh, you know, kind of go from having nothing to creating a new platform, Inspirado. Um, and in 2010, we had to come up with a different way, a better way of being able to provide this experience to high net worth travelers. And what we decided was, instead of buying the homes, we were gonna long-term lease the homes. Don't get that confused with what Airbnb and VRBO do. Don't, don't confuse internet brokerage, which everybody would be familiar with today. Again, they weren't so familiar back in 2010. But um, we view this much more like a hotel operating company. We're a lot more like Four Seasons than we are Airbnb. Because what we would do is we would take control of uh, particular assets, and that could be in Tuscany, it could be in Vail, it could be in um, Grand Cayman. And the owners of those homes would give complete control up to us. We would be responsible for the furnishings, we would be responsible for um, uh, you know, adding the OSE. We would put individual concierge at every one of these residences that actually worked for us full time. And then we would manage the experience that a guest would have in these homes the same way uh, Four Seasons or Ritz-Carlton manages a guest experience at one of their hotels. We were able to do it though with people spending $20,000 to join instead of $400,000 to join. And instead of every day being the same, instead of exclusive resorts where you buy a set number of days for a set price, like for example, buying 30 days for $1,500 a night, you'd spend $45,000 and then you would just, just use you know, day by day by day we decided to combine traditional revenue management with a club structure. So all of the Inspirado inventory was priced um, on a per night basis, revenue managed, revenue managed not terribly dissimilar to how hotels revenue manage. So less price for longer stays, seasonal changes in um, rate, and then you know could have uh, uh, variances, for example, with weekend rate versus um, weekday rate. So we launched Inspirado 2000 and, uh, January 1st, 2011. 
and um, you know, kind of grew pretty quickly on a relative basis and captured some high name um, investment um, attention from the likes of Kleiner Perkins and institutional venture partners. And then by the time we got through 11 and into 12, you know, obviously we really started to, um, uh, to grow. So I guess probably we should fast forward to um, February 29th, 2020 because there's a whole other chapter that's ha like I have three chapters in my career. One of them is only uh, whatever it is, March, April, April, May, May. And one of them's three months old. One of them was uh, call it eight years. And then the other one was 10 years. Um, so if you fast forward all the way to, um, uh, to uh, February, we had roughly 15,000 customers with two products. We have a different product now that I'll talk about, a subscription product, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and we had uh, over 600 employees. We were growing at over 30%, and we were on track to do nearly 300 million in um, revenue. So uh, lots of things kind of moving up and to the right. And then, obviously, travel is a you know heavily impacted um, business throughout, um, you know, when there is a pandemic. And um, at some point, I'd be happy to share with you how we fared through um, all of the uncertainty and um, disruption around um, COVID, because we've actually, I, I believe, um, really fared much better than any other travel cohort. So as a long winded answer uh, to a very short question, but hopefully that gives you a construct of, um, you know, uh, exactly what you're asking for, which oh, is, I think, how I got here. Absolutely. No, that's, that's amazing. I, I, you give a lot of, lot of ammo there in terms of the business models. And um, one thing that you know, stood out to me is that you almost seem to um, shift maybe a little, like you shift from ownership to renting. You, you shifted uh, you know, to something that was a lot more light, lighter touch. And I think there's been a lot of the, in the luxury market that have been trying to figure out that um, what that model is. You had one fine stay um, that, you know, decided to do kind of something similar uh, with having a lot more high touch in a certain small amount of cities uh, as compared to Airbnb. How did you think about what that line was where did you need to have a concierge living on site and the level of service versus scalability? Well, our whole business and more so now than ever before is predicated on subscription. So if you really think about at a high level, if you think about um, big categories, big uh, categories, economic categories in industry, and you think about how in hospitality, um, you know, subscription has been uh, disruptive. Um, we very early learned that um, having our customers, which we call members, pay an annual fee for traditional membership was super important because that kept the lights on. It's a high margin component um, of travel and it allowed us to um, have certainty and buy-in from our customer base. And I think what a lot of the, not I think, I know, what um, the large marketplaces suffer from is loyalty, right? I mean, how loyal are you to VRBO? Really, how loyal are you to Airbnb? Every Airbnb is just a, it's just a, it's just a way to go get to different property managers or owners to have very differentiate, uh, very different and um, uh, kind of non-consistent experiences. That's just true. And so we felt early on that we had to have a, a membership component. And um, you know, that business alone, um, just annual dues, which are $3,700 a year, you know, grew to an annual recurring revenue of over $50 million a year. So dues became really important to us and is a complete differentiator vis-a-vis -vis, um, you know, luxury retreats, one fine stay, Airbnb, VRBO, home away. Um, all of them are marketplaces. We, we refer to them as like an internet broker, basically, because they are brokering um, uh, one person's property um, through a, uh, basically through an exchange. Inspirato isn't like that at all. We have about uh, 350 homes that we control. Um, we do a lot more, by the way. We have events for members and we do we take people to the masters and we charter entire cruise, you know, luxury cruise ships and do members only um, events. But the homes are kind of the, the, 
um, you know, the mainstay of the business. And for, um, you know, for those homes, um, you know, obviously we're able to just provide a very differentiated experience that is completely branded, not dissimilar in one iota compared to if you walked into a montage hotel or a Four Seasons or any other uh, branded hotel. So, so that's been a big differentiator for us. So you actually touched on something I was about to ask about. I, uh, I've heard the term float around several times is community as a moat. And uh, you, uh, I knew you had done a lot of these kind of events and, you know, uh, renting a boat and stuff like that and actually tried to curate some of it. Uh, community and you know, communities uses a buzzword by a lot of people. I think Airbnb would use it uh, you know, all the time. Um, but clearly you, you guys actually really invest in it. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Certainly. I mean, we have, um, like I said, around, you know, give or take 15,000 customers. Um, I, I, I refer to it as a paid loyalty program. So, a, you know, a hotel will invest, um, you know, billions of dollars to gain loyalty and the way that they're gaining loyalty um, is by uh, customers using their service. Whereas we're a paid loyalty program, our customers pay us in order to get access to our uh, portfolio in our service. So especially now in a COVID environment, when you think about, you know, what do people really, really want? They want safety and they want service. They want um, cleanliness. And, you know, the Inspirato brand really stands for service and certainty. And that's why we exist. And, um, you know, well, remember, we're talking about the wealthy, call it two, three percent of the uh, uh, of the base of North American travelers. So this isn't obviously for everybody because we're spending, we have daily housekeeping, for example, as a standard. Um, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on homes just to make sure that they get up to par. And we put our own money into these homes to make sure that they're um, at our standard. So it's a whole different level of traveler with a, our average nightly rate is close to $1,500 a night, just to put some perspective into it. Um, but for that traveler, that does not want to stay in a 600 square foot hotel room, wants to stay in a house with the kitchen, but still wants the service and certainty of a five-star hotel, um, Inspirato uh, really does that. And so from a community standpoint, people feel a part of something when they pay an initiation fee or they pay a subscription and they pay their, um, you know, they pay their annual dues. So that's been, um, you know, it's, Obviously, this journey is a little over 10 years with um, Inspirato, um, and um, it's, you know, it's not for everybody, obviously, but uh, for our customer base, we have very high retention. Historical retention is in the high 80% uh, range. Um, you know, people really like it, and especially now in a kind of environment where you crave uh, safety, you know, and certainty and service more than anything, we obviously were set up for that. Hi, it's uh, Kev here. Thanks ever so much for joining us, Brent. Um, if you could take us back a little bit, I mean, anyone that's, um, that uh, it, the word pioneer is often associated with their name uh, means that they've created something new, and that's great. I mean, the, you know, the exclusive resorts was something that you pioneered that model. But when, any, when anything is pioneered, there are often either things that go wrong along the way or people don't like what you are pioneering. If you could take us back to 2002 and give us a kind of a, a taste of the, the kind of the market reaction to what you were doing with the creation of exclusive resorts, first of all. Well, I think the best example, because remember in 2002, there's no Airbnb and there's no home away. So those don't exist. So you got to like scrap that out of your mind because it's part of the you know, it's part of popular culture today. Vacation rentals yeah, are just sure. everywhere. But so forget about that. So those don't exist. So then start to think about, okay, well, who were we really encroaching upon? Who's, uh, you know, who's, who's lunch were we trying to eat? And it was really the five star. I'm sorry, go ahead. We've been uh, some timeshare as well, I suppose, is something kind of similar. Certainly here in yeah. Europe, timeshare was a massive yeah. thing in the, uh, in the 80s. Yeah. Yep, really expensive timeshares um, in yeah. the early 2000s were called fractionals, if you remember that yeah. term. Yeah. But yeah. it's a really small market. Fractionals were a tiny market. I mean, exclusive resorts would sell more fractionals in, uh, Inspirato would sell more memberships in a month than the whole fractional industry would sell in a year. So it was a small <laughs> industry. Um, 
but really it's the hotel. So really what's happening is you have wealthy people who have kids, they get two rooms at a Four Seasons, two rooms at a Ritz Carlton, and um, you know, that's how it always was. And so we were trying to encroach upon that and where there became conflict and where it became challenging for us was when a residential product was within a resort community. So if an, uh-huh. if an exclusive resort's home was inside of a, you know, Ritz Carlton development, uh, which it is true today, right? We built with exclusive resorts, we built a bunch of uh, homes inside the Ritz Carlton community in um, Grand Cayman, for example, um, that those, there was a lot of tension between brands who sort of were like, we don't need any innovation. We don't need any new ways for people to travel. People love staying in hotels. What's wrong with you? Um, And I'd say that was, uh, you know, probably the biggest point of contention. And then obviously once we got to, you know, 2012, 13, 14, 15, um, you know, Inspirata was going up and to the right at a very nice growth rate, but with a, um, you know, with a, obviously a segmented market and air before that VRBO was absolutely crushing it and becoming big. And I think sold to Expedia for three or $4 billion. And then Airbnb, just because of their infinite scale ability, you know, became this massive platform. But I think what we're finding now is that, um, you know, what comes up must come down. And when you don't have the ability to control service in any way, shape or form, and you don't have the ability to institute brand standards in any way, shape or form, um, you know, and you have millions upon millions upon millions of little, I mean, really individual hotels, right? Little independent lodging units. Um, it becomes pretty hard to uh, manage. That's an amazing business. Always going to be a multi-billion dollar business. It's a, it's a behemoth, one of the greatest success stories in my lifetime. But it doesn't play to the luxury consumer. Yeah. And um, it, it, just, it just doesn't. And so vacation rental for the luxury consumer outside of Inspirato really is a whole different level of um, risk. Just, uh, it's interesting you say, you know, the, the, the example that you gave um, Brent about, you know, you, you'd built some, uh, or you had some properties that were within a hotel kind of residential complex or within a complex there, which caused conflicts with the hotels. I mean, this is your 2002, this is your first foray into the travel tourism and hospitality industry. I mean, how did you, as an entrepreneur, kind of resolve those issues? I think that's quite interesting for many of the kind of the entrepreneurs that are tuning in. You know, early conflict with the status quo is something that many startups come up against. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely a big believer in young entrepreneurs, much more so than old old entrepreneurs like me. I mean, I have a son that's 22, super entrepreneurial, coming up with different ideas, reading and listening to podcasts and um, you know, constantly thinking and, and, and innovating. So the first thing is, is I think you just have to be, it's a young man's game, in my opinion, to be, um, you know, taking on all of these challenges. But your specific question is, how did, um, how did we sort of know what to do going into a new industry? And uh, the answer is we didn't. And that was the biggest blessing of all. Because right. what happens is people get handcuffed by their experience and the um, sacred cow, and it's always been done this way, so it has to be done this way. And we just sort of rolled in back in 2002 when I was you know, young enough to, to do that, 32, 33 years old, and basically said, well, wait a second, why does it have to be that way? We could do it this way. And so it never really dawned on us that um, you know, we were breaking so many of the traditional hospitality rules, and that was a bad thing. We just thought there was a better consumer experience that um, this high net worth traveler could have. And so we, you know, started upon this journey to, to build it, both, both from a sales and marketing perspective, but also from an operational perspective. I remember a uh, very, you know, very, very, very famous uh, CEO of a luxury travel company sat my brother and I down and said, you will never be successful, ever. <laughs> this is going to fail and it's going to fail miserably. And there's going to be a lot of very unhappy people. And we said, well, why is it going to fail? And he said, it's going to fail because you'll never be able to provide service level or um, an experience similar to a five-star hotel that has, let's call it a hundred rooms when you're one house at a time. 
And it turns out that he was wrong. It's just really expensive to do that. And nobody believed that the consumer would pay an extra, you know, four or $500 a night for daily housekeeping plus concierge service plus upgraded facilities, but they actually will if you're able to, um, you know, provide an exceptional experience. Now, there's, there really is nothing more kind of motivating for any kind of person in business than somebody telling them what they're about to do is going to fail. So I can see why that would be incredibly motivating. So uh, you, you mentioned him in your answer just then, Brent, and that was your brother, Brad. Um, a, 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 an equally fascinating history, his backstory as well. But you've both worked together for, um, for almost 20 years now across these two businesses. I think that's fascinating anyway, you know, working with a family member in something which is a high pressure kind of business, whether it's in the travel industry or whether it's a, an entrepreneurial type of setup. Can you give us a sense of how your relationship with your brother actually works? And, um, you know, without going into too much personal details, but I, think, I just think it's an interesting dynamic that is, is, is fairly rare. And I'm curious to know how it works and your, how, it's, how it's kind of grown through your childhood into your um, kind of business years. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think most family businesses are generational family businesses. Um, you know, when most people think you work with your sibling, it's, you know, your dad started the company or something like that. So, you know, obviously that's not the case. Uh, you know, Brad and I were very different growing up. He's only, he's only 15 months um, older than me. Um, but he went away to school. He went to um, he went to Penn, and then he went to UVA Law School. And he basically never came back. So from the time he left Denver, he went back east to school, and then he uh, moved out to um, the Bay Area. And he was a lawyer at Cooley Godward, and got a recruiter call from a company nobody had heard of called Auction Web at the time, which grew up to be eBay. So he, by the time I had this uh, unemployment moment back in 2002 was already, um, you know, very financially successful. So it was never like for him that he had to, you know, run a business or be the CEO or really sort of drive the growth and the operations. It was never like the business was going to be, um, you know, headquartered in um California, it was always meant to be headquartered in Denver. So since he didn't live here, and this is, you got to think back, right? People actually used to go to offices every day and like work with other people before COVID. So I mean, it was actually like a thing where we would have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of employees. And, you know, Brad was in California. So he's the chairman and does very chairman like things. So financings and big structural, uh, you know, sorts of uh, things, strategic things. And then um, you know, as the CEO, I just have very different um, role within the company. And so, you know, we've never, we've just always been able to get along as uh, business partners. It's really never been an issue, like not even for overnight. Like, I mean, you know, we have argument about something here and there, but I mean, never even lasted over one night in almost 20 years. So we're, we're very lucky in that regard. We're good compliments, um, you know for each other. And we talk about, I don't know, two or three times a day by phone and just, you know, keep pushing this peanut forward. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge. I mean, it's a, you know, every, every, um, you know, we're pretty old for people think of us as being like an innovative, you know, company. And I want to talk about how we just launched this new subscription product called pass, but you know, in the, at the end of the day, we're, you know, we've been doing this over 10 years, just this company alone. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's not like, you know, we're still trying to figure every single thing out um, every now and then we, you know, take one on the chin like everybody else, COVID being the, you know, being the best example. Can I ask you, you started two businesses in, in the, I don't want to say the exact same industry, right? Like, yeah, well, they're in the exact same industry, but obviously different, very different companies based on business model. What, why did you have the desire to go back into this and just, you know, kind of wade back in? Why didn't you want to go into a different industry? Clearly there, there was something. Well, I mean, for starters, you know, luxury vacations for rich people is not a bad, is not a bad place to hang your hat, right? <laughs> I got to hang Good out with benefits. a lot of really, really wealthy, smart people, um, you know, much wealthier and smarter than me and, and had great perks and benefits and being around awesome vacation homes. And, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been charmed. It's been unbelievable. And, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real, um, uh, 
I guess I'm a real fan of this notion that for um, people to find ultimate happiness um, professionally, and not everyone has the luxury of being able to, um, to do this, which I understand, but for people who do, if you can spend enough time trying to really isolate what your giftedness is, what are you really, really good at? And, and for me, my giftedness, which I've now learned over a long period of time, um, I've learned that my giftedness is early stage um, startup and early stage product development. And the earlier, the better, like one, two people sitting in a, uh, you know, in a conference room with a whiteboard trying to figure things out. And everywhere, every, every step away from the idea to getting it going, to coming up with the marketing and the product positioning um, into like being uh, highly operational and trying to improve efficiency, um, you know, I become less valuable in the equation. I tell that to our senior team all the time. So my giftedness is product development and marketing and understanding this consumer. And my passion has always been luxury real estate, even when I was a kid and I did not grow up living in luxury real estate, I can promise you. But I always coveted the people who did. I always knew those neighborhoods in town. I would ride my bike over and look at those houses. And it always motivated me that like one day I could, you know, I could have a house like that, or I could be part of a business that had, um, you know, access to homes. I, I can remember being on vacation in my twenties and, you know, staying at Sheridan's and picking up real estate pamphlets for multi-million dollar houses. And my uh, wife at the time was like, what are you doing? What is it? Nothing to do with us. Why are we, why are we going and looking at $3 million houses in Hawaii when we can't afford a $300,000 house in Denver, Colorado? But, um, you know, I had a real passion for it. So I think where passion and giftedness cross, if you can sort of hang out in that intersection, you have a very high degree of success, but you have a higher degree of, you know, kind of work happiness. So when I left, um, you know, exclusive resorts and it was not I wouldn't say it was voluntary I'm gonna get into all the details of it but suffice it to say that I had a differing of opinions with a billionaire that had majority control and then that's just the way that that all worked out so I was highly motivated to um, you know prove to myself that there was unfinished uh, business and there was a you know bigger and better way to provide um, this uh, customer base a great experience. So um, that's kind of how I think about, um, you know, where people should focus their energy. And for me, it was just really easy. I never even really thought after I left that I would go, uh, you know, do something that wasn't um, luxury hospitality related, coming up, figuring out how to do it, coming up with the name and working through like having to start over from total scratch and raising capital like every other entrepreneur. It was, it was clearly difficult, um, but, you know, having spent seven years prior um, learning a lot, it was easier than had I just come up with the idea for the very first time. Wow. Damn. Uh, well, I wanted to segue the discussion a little bit into kind of uh, real estate and, and business strategy and, and kind of uh, address something that uh, previously was a really big story until COVID uh, elapsed, which was WeWork um, and your real estate uh, model. And there's, you know, a lot of, uh, I'd say, controversy about using venture dollars uh, for real estate, uh, if not acquisition, but long-term leases that locked in and, and, and capital expenditures on the lease. And um, I, I know that there's a lot of uh, co-living startups and a lot of kind of other uh, people uh, tinkering in this world right now that are raising venture money, but then they're raising separate real estate funds, basically, uh, from hospitality groups or normal real estate investors. And I'm curious, you know, just you know, two-part question. One, did you use VC money for, for real estate? And two, you know, um, how do you think about uh, the um, the play between uh, physical assets and quote unquote tech scalability in this day and age? Well, that's a good question. That is a really, really good question. So we were the first, <laughs> we were the first on this, like, we're going to lease luxury homes. And it was very unpopular um, with the investment community. I mean, obviously we were able to get some blue chip investors uh, early on, but as we began to scale, 
even when we were, you know, doing a hundred million dollars, people had, uh, you know, it was asset medium. It was an asset light, Airbnb, was an asset heavy, uh, owning a building, right, or owning the hotel. It was kind of asset medium. And I'd say we definitely took some lumps for that um, and continue to. But I view it like there is no perfect. So the older you get, the more you realize that anybody who says they have the perfect solution is either uneducated or lying about anything. And Airbnb was perfect right up until that point when it wasn't. And now Airbnb is really scrambling to try to figure out how can they inspiratoize, right? Service and certainty, um, this massive platform that they were um, able to build. So I think in general, um, I am not long on the, um, the businesses that, uh, that sign long-term, our average lease is four years. Um, and every property is one individual property. So we're heavily diversified. I am not a fan of the businesses that take on 50 apartments and sign 10 year leases in hopes that they're going to squeeze out, you know, 20% gross profit. I think those businesses are the hospitality version of WeWork. And I think they're going to struggle like, forever, I think they're going to struggle. I think that that model is um, very, very, very difficult, um, if not impossible. Inspirato, remember, has, um, you know, pre-COVID had uh, well over $100 million of ARR, annual recurring revenue. We had over $100 million of customers who were paying us on a subscription. Very, very different than, um, uh, you know, everything having to be transactional. Like being being long on risk and short on commitment is not the great uh, place you want to be. Inspirato um, is call it medium, um, uh, medium on risk, but we're very, uh, we're very, very positive on commitment from our customers. It's hard for people to walk away from paying an initiation fee or paying annual dues. They feel part of something. And, um, you know, it's very different than just being transactional and going on Airbnb and trying to say, is this apartment building less money or more money, you know, to stay in a one bedroom? I think that's a tough, that's a tough road. To can, I, can I ask a quick clarifying question there? So like, I know a lot of these guys also, um, we've interviewed Sondra on here before and a few, and a few others that I know that are basically, they started out acquiring those 10, 15, 20 year leases and they tried to switch eventually over to what they called HMAs, hospitality management agreements, where they actually didn't own the lease. Um, and they basically tried to shift to more of an asset light operator model. Did you guys ever consider that? I know I'm getting a little nerdy here, but I, I do think it's a topical you know, question considering there's a lot of people innovating in this, this kind of Venn diagram these days. Oh no, and we have. I mean, there's buildings on them that say, Inspirato with American Express. Um, we've done licensing agreements. We have many, uh, many of our um, many of our homes in our portfolio today. We don't have to lease at all. They bring them to us and say, um, "Manage it for us. Here's our guarantee to you." It looks much more like a hotel management contract than it does um, a lease. And, you know, and it's a it's a very high percentage, and that percentage is growing. But it took ten years of building our brand. Um, you know, for that to be able to happen. And people understand the fact that anybody who's going to, who's going to travel with us is non-transient. Um, you know, it's very hard, I think, for an owner of an asset to um, let transient usage into their uh, platform without them at least getting the brand benefit of it being them, right? You're giving that up, right? We're not, we're not doing that. So um, it's very, uh, you know, it's, it's different. Like, like I said, I mean, the models, like you mentioned, have grown really, really fast. Um, and um, obviously, the, their market is really, really big, because it's as low as what 60 bucks a night to go stay in a place and wherever. So it's really, really big. But, um, you know, we like we really like Inspirato's strategic position in the market. We have zero competition, by the way, there is not a single company that does anything remotely close to what we do. There's no luxury company that charges a fee. There's no luxury subscription company. There's no one who controls, there's exclusive resorts, which is now much, you know, much smaller than us and a different model. But outside of the two companies that Brad and I founded, there's really nothing. And I think that's a testament to how hard this is, 
And that's a, a, you kind of your last your last uh, sentence there was what I was going to follow up with. In that, you know, um, is it because it is so hard that you haven't managed to accrue any substantial competitors? Do you sense that is something that would continue, and, some, and nobody has just got the guts to do it, or is it just the right timing? And perhaps it's uh, um, perhaps a company from a completely different geography with different kind of funding that would be able to give you a run for your money almost. I think it's really hard. Oh, well, let me put yeah. it this way. We had, there were probably 70 named companies that attempted to compete with exclusive resorts and Inspirado that have failed. So the number of burned investors, angel investors out there who were part of <laughs> you pick the name is massive. The only two standing are exclusive resorts in Inspirato. And so I think it's incredibly hard. You have to both be an operator, right? We're an operator, just like a hotel, but we're also a distributor yeah. like Expedia. And you have to be yeah. incredibly technical. Um, and, and that leads me just to, to share, I'm sure you guys have read about this, but we launched a subscription travel product called Inspirato Pass, which is endless travel, $2,500 a month, no nightly rates, taxes, and fees. And we built an algorithm that gives people access to north of 150,000 trip options. They pick what they want, they pay nothing, they check out, and they book their next reservation. And we built that business into over a $75 million business in about eight months. So that was really the growth engine prior to COVID. Um, and it's just now starting to come back. But um, if, you, if you ask me, like, what am I the most, and we've got patents on that, that's highly, highly, highly um, uh, technical and innovative how it actually works, right? The further out you book, the more value that we provide, the algorithm chooses based upon how far you're booking in advance from various room categories or various home categories, how many days the trip is based upon the day of week, et cetera. And Inspirato Pass um, really opened the door to us around this idea of subscription travel, which is really where we're headed. And post COVID um, vis-a-vis, I think any other travel company, I'm, I'm comfortable saying virtually any other travel company, Inspirato held up, not just better, but significantly better because we have recurring revenue and loyal customers that continue to pay their dues and continue to pay their subscriptions even during the downturn. And because we're asset light with leases, we were able to enact force majeure. If we would have owned those homes, we would have been the ones paying for them. So yeah. we had kind of a benefit over the hotel companies in the pandemic and a huge benefit over the um, internet brokers or the booking engines because their revenues just basically went flat, right? Just went to zero. Um, so this subscription is really where the growth is going to come from, uh, you know, from Inspirato. And some excellent perspective on the, the, the kind of the present and the looking forward. Um, the last question really from us, if we, uh, if we may make, you said, um, you talked about a multi-billionaire owner that you had a disagreement with at the end of, uh, at the end of the, the 2000s. I just wondered, um, what it was like dealing with somebody like Steve Case when you sold, um, uh, I think it was a majority of the business to him in 2004. I mean, he was going through a fairly uh, interesting time post Time Warner AOL merger at that point anyway. That was all starting to unravel. I mean, just that, that process of having to sell uh, the business at that time to someone as um, high profile as him. What was that like? Uh, you know, I, I think it actually has nothing to do with Steve at all. I think Steve's a really smart guy. Um, obviously, he was really successful in be, being both an entrepreneur as well as um, philanthropist, as well as yeah. venture capitalist. So, you know, he's been, he's been quite successful. I think, you know, I am just a raging asshole as an employee. <laughs> it's just, you know, my... My DNA is not to work for someone else, period. So, right. um, you know, that, that was sort of destined to fail before, 
before it ever happened, we were sort of enthralled with the idea. I mean, the crazy part is he only put in $5 million to get 50% of exclusive resorts. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like a lot of money, but it was at the right. time, right? When we didn't have, a, when we didn't have money and he was a billionaire. So, um, you know, I mean, I think it's the, I think at the end of the day, it could have been anybody. It could have been Steve, John, Fred, Sue, Jesse, didn't matter. Um, you yeah. know, I didn't, I don't really have a good personality for, um, you know, being an employee. And so, um, you know, it just, it just didn't, uh, you know, it didn't, didn't work out as, uh, as well as I would have thought. Also, we were under serious duress with, uh, um, you know, financial crisis and we had different goals. His goals were uh, different than mine. And I feel really good about the way it turned out for, um, Inspirato and, you know, obviously, you know, we, Inspirato is an undisputed, um, leader in this kind of luxury residential travel component. And there really is not even a close second. So it's all kind of worked out in the end. It's just the only way to make any perspective of it is to look backwards. Yeah. Great. Well, Thank you. David? Well, I can certainly sympathize by not being built for being an employee, Brent. So, you know, thank you <laughs> for joining us. I think we're going to, we're going to wrap things up here. We've come to the end of our time, but um, for everyone listening, this has been how I got here. Mosey on Focuswire's weekly podcast with Kevin May from Focuswire and myself, David Litwack from Mozio. And thanks for joining. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for listening to how I got here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.